<laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> I have. Her. Hello, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to today's Roads to Research session. See a number of you have coffee. Please help yourself if you'd like some. Um, for those who come to these, um, you'll remember that the presentation is being filmed. And today it's being live streamed as well. So welcome to those who are joining us remotely. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Dr. George Valencianos. Canada Research Chair of Innovative Learning and Technology and Professor in the School of Education and Technology at Royal Roads. Uh, the, his topic will be um, especially relevant for most of us. Um, it's entitled Openness and Ethos that it Aligns with Royal Roads Values. And he's going to speak for 45 minutes-ish and allow some time for questions at the end, so please um, hold your questions if you can until then. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Valencianos. Thank you. Hi. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, OK, great. Um, thank you for taking the time uh, to come and um, listen to my rambling thoughts. Um, I've worked on this to make sure that it's coherent. Um, so, um, so it's going to be fun. Um, most of you know me. But uh, those of you that don't, um, I'll, I'll take a few minutes to just introduce myself and tell you a little bit about me uh, so that you understand where I'm coming from. So I was born and raised in Cyprus, which is a small island off the coast of the Mediterranean. And I moved to the US uh, to, for college. Right? So, and I spent eight years in Minnesota. And I moved to Minnesota because I got this lovely brochure from this small liberal arts college uh, showing kids playing in the snow. And I had never seen snow, so I thought that would be exciting. And it was exciting for the first day. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the snow stayed on the ground for the next four months. Um, so then I realized what I, was, what I was getting myself into. But, you know, at that time, the idea of going online and exploring what Minnesota was like, um, you know, was kind of foreign to me. Um, I had used the internet relay chat and those kinds of things, but, uh, but really investigating the college um, was not something that I thought about at that time. And you know, when you're 19, you just roll with things, so it was, it was okay. But I spent eight years uh, in Minnesota, and, um, and then I, w I moved to the UK where I had my first tenure track position. After that, I moved to the University of Texas at Austin, which I was um, right before coming here. Um, in, in my many conversations with, um, with a lot of you, um, one person said, Rural Roads is like a teenager. Uh, it's a proud teenager. It has a lot to learn. Um, it's very reflective uh, of its practices. Um, and it's, it's also very reflective when outsiders um, criticize the institution. So I hope that uh, you don't see me as an outsider, and I hope that in our conversations today, um, you see my suggestions and as someone uh, on the inside looking at the institution and posing questions for us to have conversations. Um, so at the center of, of my presentation is essentially the question, what should students' learning experiences look like? Uh, and from where I'm coming from, um, those are Learning experiences that are effective, they're fulfilling, they're inspiring, um, they're caring, they're uh, empowering, and they're democratic. Um, here's another uh, story for you. Um, one of my first experiences with social media was with a website called Couchsurfing. How many of you know what this is? Okay, great, just four people, awesome. I love sh uh, sharing this story when uh, people have experiences. Um, so couch surfing is the idea of spending a night or two uh, at the couch of a stranger. Uh, <laughs> and they offer it to you for free. It's, it's as crazy as it sounds, and it's uh, as exciting as it sounds. Um, so you go online, you join this community. Um, you say, I'm traveling through, I don't know, Alabama, whatever. Um, and I have nowhere to stay, and I don't have money to spend on a hotel room. Is anyone offering their couch for me? And there's all these people online that do that, right? Um, and I can see, you know, some of you and some of your eyes thinking, 
Well, uh, I would never sleep on a stranger's couch, and I'm glad you have all of your limbs since you've gone through this. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I've lived and, and I've lived through it, um, and it was it was a great experience. So I spent the day in Diamond City, Arkansas, um, and a day in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, with a couple of people. So Diamond City, Arkansas, is a small retirement town. Um, it's a town where you are either going there to visit you know, parents or relatives or you're driving through. And I was just driving through. And um, you know, the next uh, place where we were going to stop was a few hours away. So we logged onto his website and found, uh, found a couple that was willing to host us. It was a very kind uh, elderly couple. Um, and um, Diamond City was also a dry county which meant that you had to bring in your alcohol to the county. There was no liquor store in the county um, for one reason or another. Uh, but that's what it was. So anyway, we stayed in Diamond City, um, Arkansas. And the people that hosted us made us dinner. Uh, we spent time with them chit-chatting and so on. And at the end of the dinner, we went and sat at their porch um, to just you know, hang out. And after about half, half an hour to an hour, um, you see all these people come descending to this house with their, uh, with their instruments, with their chairs, and with their liquor, right, Dry County. Um, and they all came and put out a good old, uh, good old fashioned hoot nanny for us. So we're sitting at this porch, listening to these people, you know, singing and dancing and playing folk music, and hanging out with these people that we've never met, right? Um, so the next time that I used this website, I was in England, and I went to Portugal for three days uh, because flying from England to Portugal was about 60 bucks. Yeah, it's the weekend, $60, it's pretty nice. So. Uh, so I tried to do the same thing. I emailed someone saying, hey, I'm coming in. I'd love to meet people you know, that are living here. Tell me about Portugal and so on. Um, and this person replied and said, I would love to host you, uh, but it's my birthday. And we are going to this island off the coast of Portugal. So if you want to come to this island for the two days that we're there, <laughs> uh, feel free. Uh, <laughs> I did not take him up on this invitation. But, uh, but nonetheless, the invitation was, you know, I was very happy to receive that, right? So um, why am I sharing these stories, right? Um, education, in some ways, is like couch surfing. Uh, they're both about sharing with each other. They're both uh, about making yourself vulnerable, uh, connecting with networks of people, um, encountering opportunities for learning that you might not have encountered have, had you not put yourself out there. Um, so here's the gist of my argument for, uh, for openness. Uh, the world is complex, and what's coming, down the, what's coming in the future is unknown. In the past, um, month, for example, uh, the Canadian dollar fell 10% against the, the US dollar, right? There goes those uh, weekends in Seattle uh, for, cheap, um, for cheap stuff. Um, but anyway, so things are changing really fast. We don't really know where we're headed. Um, economic conditions are uncertain. Um, digital technologies are integrated in all aspects of life. Um, in Canada, we're having conversations about transitioning into digital uh, currency for small purchases online. Um, the world is talking about things like uh, Bitcoin and digital currency and cryptocurrency and fraud and you know, all these things. Uh, we're talking about globalization, environmental concerns, energy crisis, um, and all of these things. Right? Um, society has embraced, embraced increases in connectedness, uh, openness, and, um, and participation. And at the same time, uh, railroads is recognizing the complexity, right? We're talking about experiential learning, participatory learning. We're talking about team-based education, technology-enhanced learning, right? We're, we're actively working within this uncertainty to introduce our students um, to all these issues. Um, Historically, we've seen that educational institutions reflect the values of the society in which they're in. Right? As society changes, so do the educational institutions that are in that society uh, also change. So the question uh, that I'd like to answer is how can scholarship, research, teaching, learning, uh, reflect 
um, these ideas of connectedness, participation, and openness. So I'll describe those three things next um, and see what sense we can make of them. Um, we've seen over the years in tr a transition from communities to networks. Uh, in the past, we, uh, we belonged in communities. We reached out to our communities. Our communities were very supportive. Uh, but over the years, we're seeing a transition into networks, networks where people are connected to each other in weak ties and in strong ties, compared to communities where everyone was very well connected to each other, right? Um, so from these networks can be dense. So for example, in that picture right there, the purple node, the, sorry, the orange nodes are people that um, we're at the University of Minnesota, and I'm connected to them uh, because we went to school together, because you know they were my faculty members, and so on, right? And that network is very dense, right? Everyone is connected to each other. Uh, there's a network up on, on the top that's not very dense, and I, and I can't really remember who, who or what belongs to that network, but again, I'm connected to those people, but not um, as closely as the people at the University of Minnesota, right? Second idea is that of participation. So Jenkins argues that we have transitioned from a culture of, um, from a consumer culture to a participatory culture. A consumer culture is just a culture in which we just consume the information, the products that are given to us. And the participatory one is one in which we change products, we put out products as well. So just to give you a small example. Um, when we had just arrived here, um, I put on, uh, I turned on Google Maps on my cell phone and uh, put in railroads to get directions to come here. And, um, and it came up, and the address was Douglas Road, right? Um, and it was obviously a mistake. Um, but I could click on that pin and change the address um, and report to you know, Google that that address is, is wrong, right? So. <laughs> That's, uh, that's an example of a participatory culture. I can participate in what is happening, I, I can make changes and so on. Um, network technologies have allowed us to do this. So nowadays individuals, you know, we review restaurants, we, um, we produce photographs, we write fiction, we share with each other, we take those products, we change them um, and so on. So that's, that's what a, a participatory culture is, is all about. Now openness, I like to see it as a guiding belief, as, as, uh, as a value that lies on a continuum, right? So in the same way that you can say a door is you know, completely open, half open, closed, and so on, um, that's how I see openness as well. It lies on that, on that continuum. So we have things like open entry to study. When we're talking about the open universities in the UK, right, when what makes them open was the idea that they allowed individuals that uh, were not able to go to other places to study there. Um, open resources, open teaching, open participation. Um, and when we talk about content, um, there's four descriptors that individuals like to use to categorize things as open or closed. And those things are um, the ability for users to reuse, revise them, remix them, and redistribute them. So if, uh, if you have a document that gives you permissions to do that, then it's open. Right? So think of a syllabus. If I put my syllabus out there and I say, this syllabus gives you these permissions, uh, you can take it. Um, you can use it to teach your own class if you want. Uh, but you can take out weeks three and weeks nine because w for whatever reason. right? Uh, and then you could share it back. Uh, and then someone else can take it and they can do the same thing. Uh, so here are some examples of, um, of open um, Products or practices, right? Um, a research paper, a textbook, a book that was published under such a license. Um, I've published a book under open under an open access license, um, and the PDF just available for anyone to download, right, without paying. But at the same time, it was also published in a paper format, so someone who would like that um, book in a paper format can purchase it. Um, Again, I talked about the syllabus and open course, things like source code, blog posts, uh, photographs, essays, all these things can come with open uh, licenses that individuals can use, can reuse, uh, can repurpose. 
So what kind of opportunities do open uh, ideas, I guess, or open products um, provide for us? Um, here are some. They can broaden access to education and knowledge. When you don't have, uh, when something has no cost associated to it, more individuals can access it. Uh, they can reduce costs. For example, the BC Campus Open Textbook Initiative uh, tries to um, get individuals to author textbooks um, that are free, that will be integrated across the BC system um, to replace the traditional textbooks that students have been using. Uh, this can enhance the impact of our scholarship because we can, because um, more people can access it, we can distribute more freely, um, and it can foster kind of this development of more equitable practices. Uh, here are some challenges. Um, we need to develop an understanding of what openness means, right? It's easy to say, well, it's free and it's open and here it is and use it. Uh, but what does that mean for us as individuals, as faculty members? I've talked to a lot of faculty members that have said, well, it's my kind of knowledge. Why should I just take my syllabus and put it out there for others to use, right? Or why should I um, blog about my research? Won't someone steal my ideas? Um, even though when you actually blog about your research and put it out there, you're staking a claim that it's yours already. <coughs> right? um, you're saying, it is mine, as opposed to when you're sharing it in a conference with five people and no one else outside of that group knows that it was your idea. Um, some other challenges is uh, we're facing new dilemmas. So all this, all this information uh, that is available out there. How do you manage it? How do you tag it? How do you put it in places that you can easily retrieve it later? If you're following 200 people that are writing, you know, blog posts, let's say, about a topic that you're researching, uh, how do you manage all of that, right? Uh, we might new, need new business models. So thinking again about open courses, if we're teaching a course for free, well, how would the institution survive if everything is for free, right? Um, and then we need to be uh, to be careful about using the idea of open just to just to sell products, right? If you think back to this idea of greenwashing, you know, everything was green and everything was perfect, and uh, and everyone was uh, rushing into labeling their products as green um, in order to sell them. Well, we're seeing a similar thing right now, right? Uh, if you look at the massive open online courses that we had a conversation a few weeks back, those aren't really open, uh, but people are labeling them open. Um, in order to promote them. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, open networks uh, because a lot of my research is around this and I've been thinking about, um, about uh, the book that I'm going to write. So I have a table of contents and, um, and it relates to what um, I've been talking about very well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe these networks and essentially give you a, a sense of what, what is happening when um, educators and students are participating in, this, uh, in these open networks online. Um, so um, knowledge creation and dissemination is, um, is one standard uh, outcome. Um, in the picture that you're seeing, um, so this comes from Facebook. And there were a number of researchers um, uh, in um, studying um, a lake. And these people were ichthyologists, uh, essentially collecting fish and trying to label these fish. So they had a number of fish that they, they were not able to identify. And what they did is they took pictures of this, they posted on Facebook, shared it with their uh, colleagues and said, can you help us identify this? Um, so within a day or so, all of these people came together and identified everything that these researchers were not able to identify, right? Um, and we see a lot of this, people reaching new understandings, supporting communities in understanding things that they're not able to understand by themselves and so on, sharing that work across a larger community. Um, we're also seeing a lot of tension. Right? If you've talked to um, teachers, especially in K-12 schools, um, about social networking sites, they will say um, things like, well, should we be friending our students? What do I do when a student sends me, you know, a friend request? Uh, what do I do when a, a, a student follows me online? Um, 
This quote comes from, from a faculty member that we interviewed in one of our um, research projects. And this person ha has a Facebook account. And like most of us, um, has colleagues uh, that are his friends, has students, has you know, um, all sorts of groups in there. And he's saying, I made Facebook this hybrid space. And now, every time I post, I have this conundrum, right? Well, who is reading this? Um, what are people going to make of this, um, and so on. So instead of you know, doing my work, I'm thinking about you know, my participation online. One of the things that I've been writing about recently, this idea of networks being places where we care, uh, we care about each other, and places where we support each other. Um, so there's this miscon misconception that online life is different than real life. Um, in that, you know, there's virtual life, things that we do online, right? And then there's real life, the, the, the good things, the actual things that are happening face to face. Um, but if you spend any time observing what actually happens online, you'll see that the things that are happening online are as real as they could be. Um, people will tell you that, you know, they've fallen in love online. They have uh, shared their pains or tribulations online. They have found community online. Uh, they share their struggles with debilitating diseases. They, they share their personal struggles with each other, right? And this, um, and this is not just limited to researchers and scholars, but this is, you know, it, it kind of cuts across. So congregating in online spaces and online networks to learn from each other um, and commiserate over, li over life's challenges is one, uh, another phenomenon that, uh, that I'm seeing. Uh, this is just an image of one of the networks that we've been studying. Uh, just to give you a sense of you know, how complex some of these things are, you can see at the bottom right, bottom left, um, that um, you know, that part of the network is very well connected, right? Uh, nodes represent individuals and the lines represent interactions between individuals. So you can see that there's a lot of interactions happening at that, at that bottom one. But if you see at the bottom, uh, sorry, top right, Top left over there, uh, you know, you see a couple of people that belong to this network, but haven't interacted much with others, right? And that's that's absolutely fine. I'm not <coughs> saying that every network or every individual in every network, you know, is sharing their life experiences and and crying their soul out to everyone else. But um, but there are multiple things that are happening. Um, so I love talking about the conflicts that happen online, especially between scholars and publishers. And this is, uh, this is one of those cases. So um, researchers and educators have, uh, have shown this willingness and ability to circumvent and defy the restrictions that publishers have imposed to them uh, for sharing their knowledge. Um, and open scholarship is kind of a value that, uh, that a lot of these people celebrate, right? They'll, um, they'll triumphantly post on their blog that, you know, here are my papers, access them, for example. And in, um, in late 2013, Elsevier, which is a big publisher, uh, started sending takedown notices to a number of, uh, of individuals and a number of websites that were hosting researchers' papers um, because those were um, not respecting the copyright that individuals have signed with Elsevier. Right? And it's absolutely within their rights to do so. Um, and what happened is that scholars have started talking more and more about um, needing to share the knowledge that they're creating outside of the systems. Um, there's already systems in place that uh, are built to circumvent restrictions. For example, have they not used ones like, you know, putting your paper in the institutional repository, right? Or publishing under an open access license. That allows people to share freely. Um, and then we have the not so innocuous one. So like, for example, Pirate University and the Paper Bay are websites where um, people, students usually, or, um, or individuals at institutions that don't have subscription to uh, databases that provide those papers, they go to these websites and say, I need George's paper from 2013 and my library does not subscribe to it and I'm not going to pay 50 bucks for it. 
Um, can you put it there for me to download? And then colleagues from around the world go ahead and do that, right? They go into their own library, download that paper, and put it on that website for the individual to download. Um, and so that's a very organized system to go around, uh, to run, go around these restrictions, right? Uh, but individuals also do it very uh, informally as well. So taking a paper, throwing it on, in Dropbox and giving it that link to a colleague, um, doing it on Twitter, there's all sorts of ways that people have figured out ways to go around the system that prevents them to share, um, to share knowledge. I was talking to a colleague a few weeks ago, a few months ago, and, um, and she said, what I do online is just a facade. Not me, right? It's just, um, I, um, it is kind of me, but I'm not sharing everything about me. Um, and this is one thing that came up in uh, research in that the expression of identity online, uh, it appears to consist of fragments of what we believe is acceptable to others. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, if you have an account on a social networking site, it's very likely that uh, friends from high school, colleagues, parents, siblings, spouses, um, all these groups are within your list, right? Um, so we've found that the things that people share are things that they believe are acceptable to all these groups of people together. So what they're sharing is not just you know a facade, but it's really, it's, I'm sharing myself, but I'm only sharing a little piece of who I am because that little piece is acceptable to everyone because what I'm going to say to my partner is not the same thing that I'm going to say to you know, my priest or my father and so on. Okay. Um, and then we've seen, um, we've seen networks as, as being transparent. Um, the, the things that we do online um, make activities and practices transparent. The paper rejection repository is one of these examples. So um, this is a website that individuals go to and post rejection letters that they received from journals when they published, when they submitted their work, right? And usually this happens, you know, behind closed systems, right? You submit your paper, then you get an email that says your paper was bad um, because ABC, you go to the next journal and so on, right? So uh, individuals have gone onto this website and have posted um, an abstract of their work um, and the responses that they received from which journal and then which journal ended up uh, publishing their work. Um, RateMyProfessor.com uh, is, another, is another example of transparency. And um, we can debate the validity of the ratings. Um, but you know, I'm not necessarily interested in whether they're valid or not. What I'm interested in that is, is the fact that it's there. Um, and it acts as an information source for students. Um, especially at large universities when individuals um, have um, choices between hundreds of courses to take. Uh, this website has served as an information search for students, either to pick easy classes because they need an easy class to graduate, um, either to pick you know, a class that seemed interesting to find, to compare between professors, uh, between you know, the same classes but taught by different people and so on. Um, And here's a couple of other examples uh, to the right and to the left is, you know, um, reviews for, for the university. If you search online, you'll find them. You'll see that um, they're highly rated, which is good. Um, and the second uh, image there, the adjunct, pro the adjunct project, is an example of uh, what happens when uh, people come together to, uh, to be transparent about their work practices. So in this case, individuals came together and posted pay and working conditions uh, of adjuncts uh, across the United States uh, to clarify and to show to the world what, uh, what it is like and under what uh, conditions uh, contingent labor uh, works under. Okay, um, 
So what does all of this mean for our roads? Um, I've tried to capture some of the interesting phenomena that are happening online. Um, but really, we should come back to us. We should come uh, full circle and ask, well, what does this mean? Um, and I have a number of conversation prompts that I'm going to share with you. Um, I don't like to use the word recommendations uh, because I'm still learning and I think it'd be healthy for us to think of this as conversation starters as opposed to suggestions of what we should do. Um, so that's how I'm framing them. And uh, I'm just going to run through this quickly and then we'll have about you know 20 minutes maybe for discussion. Uh, so here's one. Does the existing technology and infrastructure limit our potential? What opportunities do cl cloud-based collaboration tools provide? Um, Gabriel, for example, um, is the same system that I used when I was an undergraduate student at uh, a small institution like this one. Right? Um, does it limit what we do? Um, does it add to what we do? Maybe it does. Um, oh, I forgot to mention. So there's, there's two facets to this, right? And I like to do this in my classes. There's the, the appreciative inquiry facet where we talk with students um, and we tell students to, you know, um, figure out what is really good about where we are right, and appreciate that. And then there's the reflective practitioner aspect, right, where we ask students to reflect on their practice and take, um, take back what is positive out of what they learned and implement it. And think back how we can change the things that didn't go so well. So both of these things come together um, here in this conversation prompt. Okay, here's, here's this one that the UN is going to love, uh, beyond the discussion board. Um, the discussion board is a great tool. It's a fantastic tool. It provides strong pedagogical opportunities, but it is only one tool, right? Uh, there are numerous other ones that provide a whole slew of opportunities. So how can we capitalize on those in our courses? Um, I'm very excited every time I walk into CTED and I see all the wonderful expertise that, that's there. Um, but you know, I'm also disappointed when I see people working on um, producing courses uh, instead of uh, working on the design of them. So thinking about viewing CTED as a learning design place, as an experimental pedagogy environment, right? As an environment that, uh, that would propel us forward, I say, I think is, is a valuable conversation to have. Um, this is something that I'm working on uh, myself as well with my own blog. Um, I have my papers and I post them online as PDFs, but that's not the best way to you know, post them there. Uh, but essentially, uh, I think we should be publishing documents online in format that allow people to find them, that allow people to share them, change them, search within them. Um, what does that mean? That means choosing HTML over PDF, using PDF over things that have bells and whistles and avoiding proprietary formats. And here's an example. If you go online and search for core elements of our teaching and learning model, um, you will find, yeah, that's what Google returns for me, right? The first link is a PDF of the learning and teaching model. Um, and then there's a number of other links that are HTML pages that refer to the learning and teaching model. You won't find this, right? This is the learning and teaching model put in a proprietary format that Google cannot index and people cannot find. Even though you know, it looks great, but it could still look great in, in an HTML format that would allow people to find it and share it, right? Um, which is why I'm really excited about you know, working on the project that, uh, that Doug is on, that a number of you are on, um, about creating um, creating case studies around our teaching and learning model on sharing that. And that's just a plug for that. Please uh, please consider submitting to that project. We're really excited about it. Mary's involved too, I believe. Um, OK, here's another one. Uh, and I've talked to a number of you about this. But I think that every Royal Road student should learn the ways of the web and network technology. And I came across this lovely project that I enjoy sharing with people. And it's called Domain of One's Own. Uh, but what we should be doing is we should be helping students in establishing, maintaining, and refining an intentional digital presence, especially people in BCom, especially in any communication program, people in Mallet, um, any educator, uh, and so on. But what this idea entails is this. 
In the same way that people come to an institution and buy books and buy you know, material for their courses, buy material to prepare them for, for this experience that we're providing, um, the first thing that they should purchase or the institution should provide um, is a domain name and a hosting space, and they should manage that. Um, not, you know, not to say everything that you do <laughs> should go online, but to learn how to manage their digital presence, learn what to put online, when to put it online, and how to do that. Um, and with that goes the idea of integrating this personal space uh, into our courses, right? So if everyone had their own blog, if everyone had their own space um, throughout their one or two or three years here, uh, how could that work with our individual classes, right? That also allows us to take the students outside of the LMS that's kind of focused on the institution and look outside and bring other people in and have conversations with people that are out there, right, that are part of the professional community that these individuals belong in um, and have conversations with our students. Um, I think we should enact a supportive and collegial open access uh, policy uh, pertaining to research and scholarship. Um, and I'm saying uh, supportive and collegial because uh, different disciplines have different uh, requirements and different things that they value. Uh, we should be respecting that, but um, I think that considering how we can make our research and our teaching more widely accessible is important. Um, for example, we can consider publicly available syllabi with open licenses that individuals can share and reuse, uh, student theses with open licenses, um, our publications and presentations and so on. Um, if you think back to that idea of the participatory culture, um, I was talking about how individuals nowadays can participate on the web, produce parts of the web and so on, right? And, um, and this idea aligns very well with kind of uh, progressive pedagogies that a lot of us embrace. Um, so I like to think of students in my courses um, as producers of materials, right? Not just individuals who come to me and I give them books to read and then they spit back that information to me. But I like them to create things that other people will find valuable. Not just me, right? Other people in the community. So how I've tried doing that in the past is by asking students to write public blog entries, right? Um, and that's, that's an easy thing to do. Uh, but more recently, I've asked students, I've worked with students to, um, to gather their essays around the topic and publish electronic books um, with open licenses that other individuals can use. And Amy had a conversation with me, and she is you know, considering doing that same thing in her own class, but I think it would be great if Rare Roads was able to support something like this. And, uh, and individual instructors could work with CTED to, for students to produce materials that we could either use in future classes, or you know, UBC can use in their courses, or you know, whatever institution out there, or whatever practitioner out there could find value in. Now, this is just an example of what, what that ebook looks like, right? It's just a collection of HTML pages put together in an electronic book. Um, okay, so I think we should share more broadly. Think of open as default, uh, switch to closed if needed. I'm not saying that closed is not needed and we should always be, you know, the door should always be completely open. Um, but, uh, but we can think of that. Um, one of the great things that I like about this university is flexibility, right? And we talked a lot, I've talked to a lot of people about flexibility and how we support our students to do the types of things that they want to do. Um, and, and I think we're doing great. Um, I think flexibility can be integrated in, in all sorts of other ways in our programs. For example, we can think of flexible residencies, so giving choices to students whether they want to be here or whether they want to do those residences online. Um, obviously, that imposes um, things that we have to have conversations around, right? So how do you actually integrate people in face-to-face -face residencies um, and allow them to have the same experience while they're not here? That's why it's a conversation and not a solution. <laughs> um, anyway, okay. Um, 
students come to us with a wealth of prior experience, right? Then we, and I personally like that. A lot of you like that. We value that. Uh, we have great conversations in our classes because of the experience that our students have. And it's fantastic. Um, and I think we should be more open to that expertise. Um, one way to do that would be to experiment with pathways that recognize that expertise. We have in place prior learning assessment. Um, and we can think about how that might align with a competi competency-based pathway to either certificates or degrees or, or ways that we can value what they have learned before they have come here. And, and Doug has written a fantastic paper on, um, on competency-based um, approaches um, that, uh, that I loved reading. So if, you, if you're interested in that, you can reach to Doug. Um, Let's see, I think we should experiment with public, um, public courses, uh, what other people might call open courses. Uh, but this can take a lot of forms. They can be a week long, they can be 12 weeks long, they can be three weeks long. Um, they can be coupled with our traditional courses. In the original open courses that were offered, um, there were two strands that were very well integrated. The first strand was the students that were at the institution uh, paying for the course. And then the second strand was the individuals that were distributed across the world that were not paying for the course. Um, and that, uh, that worked well, and both groups benefited from, from that interaction, from that experience. Okay, and this is the final one. Uh, I think we should develop a learning technologies lab, an experimental lab on campus. Um, and these are a list of potential activities. It could be a research lab and an experimentation lab where we design, develop, and take to market technologies that propel uh, education forward. Um, we could host research fellows and we could host state-of-the-art um, software and hardware to share across BC and Canada. For example, I can see this room being a place where we can host a supercomputing facility and provide access to researchers across Canada to spend time with the software to you know, do visualizations of all sorts of social science data. Um, and we could provide services to other institutions that would either like to you know, emulate the model that we have or try out different models for, for their organization and so on. Okay, and that's that. Uh, <laughs> all right, so thank you for, uh, again, for coming, for taking the time. Thank you to our, uh, to our online audience. Uh, I appreciate you uh, sticking with me throughout the lecture. I don't generally lecture. Uh, this is probably the longest that I ever lecture. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. I'll take questions um, and we can have a conversation about anything and everything. I'll, I'll just jump right to your last point and sort of, okay, you have, there's this vision of Royal Roads, you know, really it's being a leader but also providing these services out, as you said, the computing, the knowledge, the, the other pieces. So what do you see as the key steps we would need to take to get from now? to on the path and perhaps someday there? Um, conversation, I think, is a, is a good start um, to this. Um, bringing people together who share that vision, uh, looking for funding opportunities, um, you know, looking at what, what other individuals are doing so we're not replicating, looking across the province for collaborations. I think all those things are good first steps. and involved in the research office because they have expertise. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a portfolio, online e-portfolio component to a couple of our courses that I have. <coughs> and um, one is in the MA in Educational Leadership, the other is in the Econ, uh, in prof no, sorry, uh, BA in Professional Communication. And where I think um, we definitely ran into some challenges was um, that whole like, idea that you mentioned of managing the online presence and it being part of a course, but um, not like we couldn't host it. We can't host them because uh, the students are going to leave the university 
will no longer have access <coughs> to, to the host. So it became a little bit, like, it's a little bit tricky, uh, just the managing of it and not having a lot of clear policies around it. So yeah. And, and it's very unfortunate, right, that they're, um, when students go to an institution, they do things and then they have to, you know, leave those things behind, right? It, it's their, their work, they should be able to move it around. Right? So I think the idea of supporting students in creating their own space to host their portfolios outside of the institution so that we don't have those problems is important. Um, but you're right, there's other challenges and conversations that we need to have, right? So what if someone comes and says, I really cannot be in an open um, online environment. Um, I really cannot put myself out there because of a number of reasons. Um, well, what do you do then? Uh, so that's when you have conversations about anonymity. You could, you could do this anonymously if you want. But, um, but it's there where you will have conversations about um, you know, access to the professionals in your field, um, you know, understanding what these means, um, understanding the implications for privacy and confidentiality and all of that. And just, just as, uh, to add to that, when I was in China, I couldn't access a lot of my students' sites because they were censored in China. Um, but some of my students did um, have password protected sites. And they, anyway, it just got to be quite messy in terms of openness and then international mm -hmm. work and, you know, some of those implications. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the things that um, should be part of what the students are learning, right? So learning about virtual private networks, how to circumvent restrictions, uh, how to, you know, um, how to work with uh, services that are that are available, you know, like all of these things, I think are important for them. And, you know, th that's, I, I think those are great learning opportunities. Um, for institutions that have been successful sharing their syllabi publicly, what, what's your view on, on how they've done that successfully? Thinking about financial models and you know other things faculty might worry about. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, I don't spend too much time thinking about uh, business models, you know, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but um, I want to point out two things. First is this worry uh, that comes from individuals about sharing and about others stealing their ideas. And I can honestly say that I've never seen that happen. Um, so sharing publicly does not necessarily mean you know, just throwing things out there on the open web and saying, here's my stuff, take it. There's, uh, in the same way that there are, um, that there's copyright, there's other licenses that individuals cannot touch to their um, syllabi, for example, that allow others to reuse them, but require them to, you know, point out where that came from. It's a, you know, it's a form of citation. Right? Um, and I find that individuals have been um, have been really good at respecting that. Um, I I had an assignment um, in the prior class that I did. <coughs> That, that I shared, and, and a colleague took it and changed it um, and used it in her class. And it was such a fantastic feeling to know that, you know, that, was, uh, that was helpful to someone and that you know, she could improve what I did. Um, so now from the institution's perspective, there's, so there's different conversations, right? How does the institution encourage it and support the faculty members to do it? And uh, the other conversation is, should the institution play a role in providing, providing repositories, for example, to host all these things, right? Um, and I haven't personally seen an institution that does the latter. I've seen institutions do that with research papers, but I haven't seen been done as much with uh, research, with the teaching materials. Well, MIT is a big was the pioneer, I think. Probably. With open courseware, yeah. yeah. So that's you know that's one example of that uh, that we can look at. Mm -hmm. So George, I love your work. 
I feel like I'm a soulmate with you. <laughs> Thank you. We're Megan. also at two different ends of a vector. Uh, you're a thought leader in this area of openness, about innovation, and about these kinds of values. And then I run a department that is constrained by business process, academic conservatism, uh, and serious budget shortfalls. In the period that you're here over the next few years, how would you suggest we have these conversations to actually not maintain those two domains of theory and practice, but actually bring these two worlds together to make Royal Roads awesome and get beyond this? That's a great question. <laughs> That's how I answer it. Um, <laughs> I think that in this conversation that we've been having, right? So Vivian and I have been getting together having drinks at uh, local bars because they want to understand what the <laughs> local is. Like. Should um, we want to share that? <laughs> well, we we're about to open it up to everybody. Yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, this conversation that we've been having, that we're having right here, right, that we, we have every month in this first research uh, series. Um, I think we should have uh, these conversations more um, frequently, more openly, and more honestly, um, with an eye to you know not just talk about things, but with an eye to um, take action. And yeah. So just to to play on that a bit, and um, I'm looking around the room. I've been in meetings with many of you quite recently. Mary, you're just in front of me there. We talked the other day about creating faculty web presence uh, so that, yes, of course, our students like the University of uh, Mary Washington, whatever that fabulous one is, uh, we don't even have that for faculty here, let alone for students. We have a project right now that Mary is leading that that could be the beginning of this kind of thing. Then I look around the room to my colleagues uh, that are sitting here from the IT services group they're so constrained that they, they will struggle with helping us have web presence for faculty and students because of our limitation of people to support that kind of environment. So we have immediate opportunities here every day with the meetings that we're all having to try to bring these values to the table. Um, I think, I mean, I'm, I wish that the whole university was at your session here today so that we could use it as a call for action to start making this kind of stuff happen because every meeting we're in, we can adopt those values and, and act on them with, with in the constraints of lobbies. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, that, and that's why, um, that's why I love seeing so many of you here today, right? Because it's easy for you know me to talk to someone who shares my values and say, hey, we should do this. Well, yeah, it's just you know, two of us saying, oh yeah, we should do this, but there's you know this, context around us, right, that, uh, that either supports or constrains a lot of the practices. Um, so, so, again, thank you for showing up and sharing. I'm going to go to uh, Amy and then, and then Tracy. Well, Vivian was talking, Charles made the point to me that, you know, we could just use existing blog platforms. And then I realized that I actually have one and it's then linked to Rose, right? And so I guess, like, like, while we are constrained, I, I also wonder how can we leverage more there's exciting individual things people are doing and they kind of just disappear into the ether. And how I've seen change happen historically around here is student demand. So if you know what I mean, if someone's doing something small in the class and students love it and they demand it, that ultimately then rolls into, um, you know, it's not because we're asking for it, it's because um, students push for it that things change often. And so I would, how do we leverage those small experiments instead of just letting them disappear? And you know, that's, it's an issue that every institution has been to, right? There's pockets of innovation here and there. Um, and, and we always look at those pockets to see how we can take that to scale. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is not just a problem that you know, this university is facing, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an university organizational issue. And we don't have to wait for the infrastructure, I think, was Charles's point. Like, we have blogging. In, in we do, but there's FOIA clock issues as well. You know, it, it would be easy if we were south of 49 and we didn't have the provincial government FOIA clock issues. Uh, to make a blogging platform work here in Canada, let's say we used WordPress, maybe um, one of the 
ideas that I have is that we should be going to BC Campus slash BC Net mm -hmm. and saying on behalf of all of us in the province, please support us with our need for web space for both faculty and students to present their good work within the 40, you know, north of 49 so we don't have the toy pop issue. Another complication to that, though, is that when organizations like that start acting like ISPs rather than educational institutions, they are subject to certain legalities that they're not as educational institutions. So, you know, I mean, there is that larger context all the time that does constrain things to a certain extent, no matter how open you want to be. Which is why I really like the idea of students pursuing their own domain space, right? To, to to circumvent the problems that are there that prevent us to do the work that we want to do. Tracy, do you have? Um, well, I was just going to say, it seems like from your um, the pieces of your original argument, uh, the world's complex, uh, the world is complex, historically the institutions reflect the society that they're in, we are becoming more open. So it seems like this is a foregone conclusion that we're heading in this direction. So for us, how do we kind of get there and maybe be leaders there and align ourselves. And then I think of the other thing that you said, which is just be open by default, right? And close if necessary. That's a small thing, but it could be a huge thing. I recently uh, was treated to see a demonstration from a software company that we're hoping to uh, get into business with as for our media repository. Their name is MediaCore, they're local, and there's these hotshot geeks, right? They're amazing. And their stuff is beautiful. They're just, it's elegant, it's simple in the way that Apple products are that way. And I, I'm like, you guys, you know, your stuff is beautiful. Like, how do you, like, what is, are you, what? How? And they said, we design for mobile. That is where we start. Then we scale up to your big desktop and your huge monitors. So of course, right, the simple first step of we design for mobile first. And it's the same kind of thing. If we could go open first, Let's just assume we're going to put everything out there and claw it back. That could make a huge difference just in our whole kind of culture. Some of my friends who are really dedicated to um, you know, this cause argue that anything that's publicly funded should be open to the public, right? I agree. <laughs> it's a duty. It's a, it's a moral imperative to make it available. Um, so two comments. Um, just to extend on that comment, uh, uh, so the others can understand as well. The idea is that if, if it's funded by the public, the taxpayer or has already paid for it. So taking a paper that the taxpayer has already you know, paid for and putting it in the hands of the publisher who then charges again for people to have access to it means that the taxpayer is double paying. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to this idea of like how do you be open, I mean, I would encourage everyone to think, you know, you, Obviously, not everyone's going to leave up this session. Like, oh, I'm open. I'm going to do the end of it. Like, out there, <laughs> transparent, and whatever. Um, but, you know, think about one practice that you have that could benefit by being out in the public. Um, and think about, you know, uh, whether that single practice could be shared and in what ways it could be shared. Um, and, you know, that's, if that's one thing that you think after this session, uh, I'll say I'm happy. Then you want <laughs> um, do you have any other comments we're coming to the end? Anything online? Oh, okay. But, so let's take Alice's question and then close. Um, quick question, quick comment. The quick question is in the call for cases. I believe it says current innovations or current practices. Is it deliberate to keep it as current rather than past innovations? Vivian, do you know what answer to that question? The call for cases around the learning, learning and teaching model. And so, the case studies, you know, the case yeah, studies. yeah, and you're saying is it just current? Or I current. think we're open to anything. Okay. I'm just sending the question to Vivian because I was yeah. not involved okay. in the original yeah. discussion. And the, and the quick update, because there are so many great people in the room, um, BC Campus has hosted an annual event, and I was talking with them the other day uh, about it, and we were saying, might we morph it into having a bee tree, a, a term some of you would know, this fall in Vancouver. This is a, an annual event that's happened for many years that's famous for making off-site participants as welcome and engaged as the on-site participants. And rather than having it in California, there's a good chance it will be up in, in Vancouver this coming fall as well. So that could be an interesting opportunity for Royal Roads to Lurk, participate, sponsor, learn from, add to, in fall. So, thanks. 
Could I just add future to that? Sure. Because I saw that call and sighed because my programs don't fall under the railroad's learning and teaching model. And my job, my challenge, is to try to make fully online programs be part of that learning and teaching model. So I loved your idea of the virtual residency. Then I could have residencies. <laughs> anyway. But the learning and teaching model is far beyond the stuff that goes on in residencies. No, no, I realize yeah. that. But I have solely online programs. But that's what I'm saying. Okay. Learning and teaching model is can absolutely be embedded as part of the online learning. Yeah, well, it's just that everyone thinks of the blended model as being the learning and teaching model. Right? That's interesting. That's interesting. <laughs> it's one o'clock. So I just want to give people an opportunity to leave who need to, but if George is available to stay after and if there are more questions, um, perhaps you can do that. That was uh, excellent conversation starters. Um, Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you.